Well, there's plenty. <laughs> uh, let's stand together, friends, and sing hymn number 722, Wonderful Words of Life. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the Blessed One gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinner, list to the loving God. Wonderful words of life, all so freely given, moving us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, so only Savior, sanctify forever. Wonderful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Amen. Our text this afternoon is John's Gospel, chapter 6, and verses 22 to 34. John 6, 22 to 34. The apostle writes, On the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except that one which his disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone, However, other boats came from Tiberias, near the place where they ate bread, after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. 
Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So we come today to a passage that almost defies comprehension. One in which we see the truly irrational and spiritually blind nature of unbelief. We would do very well to pay attention to it. Our text picks up the morning after Jesus had fed this massive crowd of 5,000 men plus women and children in this incredibly amazing way, a miraculous way, by taking the five loaves of bread and two small fish that Andrew finds a boy carrying in a basket. And Andrew brings the boy to Jesus. And Jesus, in front of this massive crowd, all of whom are paying attention to him, he takes the bread and gives thanks and breaks it and breaks the fish. And they just start multiplying. And the disciples take these fish and these and this bread and they give it to the whole crowd so much so that everyone who was hungry could eat to their heart's content they were completely full so full even that extra pieces were gathered up there were 12 extra baskets there was just one basket originally one basket five little loaves of bread and two small fish enough for 50 fish sandwiches which is total if everyone had a little tiny piece of fish on it. And Jesus does this sign in front of all of them. And the people were so impressed by what Christ had done. What did they want to do? They wanted to make him king by force. Of course they would want to make him king by force. Who doesn't want a king who can provide for you? That's the kind of king we all want, a king who's able to provide. They want to make him king by force, but he withdraws from the crowd. He sends his disciples alone in a boat by themselves across the Sea of Galilee. While he goes up on the mountain to pray, he dismisses the crowd. The whole crowd sees the disciples leave without Jesus. They even see the direction that the boat is going in toward Capernaum. They all leave. They come back the next morning because where's the last place that they saw Jesus? Same place where he was before. That's where they thought he was going to be. Little did they know, Jesus crosses the sea by walking on the water. Learned about that last week. Jesus tread foot on the waves and he met with the disciples who were wrestling against this terrible storm that had arisen. They were terrified when they saw this figure on the water walking by them until they heard his voice. When they heard the voice of their shepherd, they welcomed him into the boat. And the text says immediately they were at the land to which they were going. The boat got there. And that's where we left off. That's where our passage picks up today, this crowd that had eaten the miraculous supper the evening before came back to see Jesus at the mountain the next morning, surely hoping that multiplied eggs and French toast would be waiting for them, of course. But when they got there, Jesus was gone. The people investigated where he could have gone. It says in verse 22, the next day the crowd that stood on the other side of the sea, the side which Jesus and the disciples had come from, they saw that there was no other small boat there except one 
And that Jesus had not entered with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples had gone away alone. So these people were paying attention to what the disciples were doing, what Jesus was doing. They saw him send them off. And they left without him. So they do this investigation. Well, the last time we were here, it was one small boat. That's the boat that's still here. So Jesus didn't get into that one. And surely he didn't take a giant boat himself. He would need a whole crew to man one of those. So where did he go? And all these other boats started coming around. And the people who were there, this crowd, they decided we're just going to go in the direction that the disciples went in. Because surely where the disciples were would be where Jesus would be. He must catch up to them at some point. So they get into these boats. You know, I was thinking about this. There either was just a fraction of the crowd who was there before who got into the boats, because we're talking 5,000 men were there before, plus women and children. So there was either just a fraction who got into these boats to go across the water, or there was a lot of boats that were there um, I think probably the first one is what occurred. I, I don't, I don't foresee 20,000 people crossing the Sea of Galilee on boats. Um, but it's still called a crowd. And it was a crowd of people who were there the night before, the day before and the night before. And they set out on their hunt for Jesus, and they finally land on the other side. As soon as the boats land on the other side, who do they see? Jesus and the disciples. Verse 25, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? The crowd knew that it would have taken Jesus a much longer time to go around the lake, and they knew he didn't take a boat. So they were very curious uh, to find out how he got to the other side. Did you catch a ride, Jesus? Did someone pick you up in the middle of the night and bring you over on a boat? That's what they were asking. And yet, Jesus does not tell them, well, no, guys, I walked on the water. He does not say that to them. He does not go into detail and tell them the story of the storm or Peter walking on the sea to him or the boat immediately reaching the dock after Jesus got into it. He tells them none of those things. Instead, he reveals to the people their inner motives in seeking him. He doesn't even answer their question. Rabbi, when did you get here? This is what Jesus said. Jesus answered, verse 26, Jesus answered and said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him... The Father God has set his seal. And therefore they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. One of the things that we've seen over and over in our study of John's gospel thus far is Jesus' unique insight into the thoughts and intentions of man's heart. He knew what is in a man. He knows what is inside of us. He's the searcher of our hearts. He knew there was no guile in Nathaniel. He knew the past of the Samaritan woman. He knew the secret sins of the invalid at Bethesda. He knew the Pharisees' inner disdain from him, for him rather. And he knew why this crowd was seeking him. We don't know the motivations of other people, but Jesus knows the motivations of everybody. He does. He's the only one that does. And I want to say, as I've said this before, because it keeps repeating. You know, even, even as I've studied John's gospel to preach it, sort of different 
Just in my experience, it's different than my experience of reading the gospel, studying it to preach it. You have to do exegesis and you study the passage and see where it relates to other places. I, I get to spend more time in it. As a matter of fact, what I, what I give then on a Sunday morning is like the tip of the iceberg compared to, you know, what there really is there. It's so deep. You could go back and I could preach all six chapters of John's gospel again and have completely different messages each time because the word is alive and there's so much there, something else to focus on, some facet of the jewel. But one thing that I've noticed, I've just noticed it more and more, is John's emphasis on Jesus knowing the heart. He shows it over and over and over. And this Inner knowledge that Christ has is so unique that the Bible says that God alone possesses it. 1 Samuel 16, 7. Man looks at the outward appearance, but Yahweh looks at the heart. Yahweh does. Do you see that? Yahweh alone has the ability to look on the heart. Therefore, in this insight that Jesus has, he exposes his own divinity. Just in John explaining how Jesus knows the motivations of the people who are attacking him. He knows the motivations of those who are interested in him. He knows the motivations of those who are his disciples. He knows it all. And that's insight, that's knowledge that God alone has. Therefore, since Christ has it, that means what? Christ is God. He's God the Son. He's God the Son. So the crowd says to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And instead of answering their question, he reveals to them why they sought him. Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate loaves and were filled. These people were only interested in Jesus because they saw him as a meal ticket. That's why they were seeking him. Jesus reveals that. He said, it's not, you're not looking for me because you saw signs. In other words, because you saw the sign that I did, which pointed to me as the divine savior. You're not coming to me because of that. You're coming to me because you had some really good, warm French bread yesterday. That's the reason why. That's what he says to them. They wanted Jesus only to supply their carnal appetites but they had no comprehension that the miraculous meal that they had eaten from his hand was actually not an end in itself, but rather a sign which pointed to something greater than a free meal. They were not seeking Jesus to worship and obey him as Lord and Christ. Rather, they merely desired the food that they believed that he could give them. Yeah. Friends, there's a tremendously important application for us in this why are we seeking jesus that's the question why are we seeking jesus the american church by and large over the last 50 years has tragically fallen into the same exact trap as this crowd and not only has the church fallen into the trap it has taught that trap. It's taught it from the pulpit. It's taught people that this sort of motivation in coming to Jesus is right and appropriate. Come to Jesus. It is his great desire to make you happy. Come to Jesus. He will grant you prosperity. Come to Jesus and he will fulfill your desires. That's the message of the largest megachurch in America. That's the message of it. It's the message of Joel Osteen. Friend, God wants you to be successful. He wants you to be happy. It's like, whoa! These people 
who ate the loaves and the fish, they would have said, yes, Joel Osteen, that's what I want. That's the reason why I'm going to find Jesus and seek him. That's why I'm going to get in the boat. That's why I'm going to look for the disciples. It's because he can make me happy. I saw it yesterday. I was hungry, and then I had the greatest meal of my entire life. I think you can probably bet on it that that was a pretty good fish and bread that Jesus made. Pretty good. Why is Joel Osteen's church the largest church in America? It's because that is actually what tickles men's ears. But it's not only in prosperity type churches where you find such ideas. It's not only there. I cannot tell you how often I personally have been in a church where I have heard someone say, I'm here for the music. I'm here because the music is so good. Man, I've looked at other churches. And this church just has powerful, man, the, the songs are so good, man. I've heard it with my own ears in evangelical churches, in, in congregations that should know better, that should teach better. I'm here for the music, or I just love the fellowship. I love the fellowship. I love the fact that we have lunch together afterward each time. I come here because these people are so nice, and the fellowship is so good, and the food here is great. And all of that is the wrong motivation in coming to Jesus. Jesus would say to such a person, you're not seeking me because you saw the signs that the Bible reveals about me. You're seeking me because when you come here, you have your fill. That's why. Do not work for food that perishes, but that which endures to eternal life. Someone who says these things, I'm here for the music, I love the fellowship, I love some other aspect of it. If that's their motivation, it's in the wrong place. Someone who says that is seeking Jesus for the wrong reasons. They love the benefits of Christ without the cross of Christ. What does the Bible say about those who pursue such motivations? Paul tells us, now listen now, this is what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 to 20, and he cries about it. There's not much that makes the Apostle Paul shed tears, all right? The Apostle Paul is a pretty tough guy. He's gone through a lot. Even his whippings don't make him shed tears. But there is something that makes him shed tears. Here it is, you ready? For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, listen now, whose God is their appetite. Whose God is their appetite. That's actually a form of idolatry. Their God is their stomach, their food. Paul goes on, whose glory is in their shame, who sets their minds on earthly things. And that makes Paul shed tears for those who live as enemies of the cross of Christ and instead whose motivation is only on the temporal benefits of Christ. He says, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly await a Savior, a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see how in Philippians 3, then, Paul juxtaposes those whose God is their belly with those who eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Which one are you seeking after? The fulfillment of carnal desire or a savior from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. Something for all of us to consider.
to examine ourselves to see if we are truly in the faith, what it, our motivation really is. Very well. So after Jesus then diagnoses this very serious problem with the motivation of the crowd, he then gives them the cure for it. And this is the cure. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God has set his seal. The Father, the Father God has set his seal. Okay, so Jesus now begins this new section of John chapter 6, a discourse on true spiritual food. We're going to be talking about this for at least the next couple of weeks, Lord willing. And he explains the foolishness of striving after temporal benefits instead of seeking eternal life in him. He says, do not work for food that perishes. Of course, he's not telling his, these people to quit their jobs or not provide for their families. That's not what Jesus is saying. When he says, do not work for food that perishes, he's not saying, well, you can live as a vagabond now. I'm freeing you from, uh, <laughs> from your jobs. No, no. What he's saying is this, that the focus and strength of our labors should be on eternal things, on eternity. That should be the focus of our labor. That should be the strength of our labor. That should be what we are constantly focused on, eternity. Eternity and the things of eternal importance. And I've heard this saying, oh, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. But you know what I've never seen? I've actually never seen a person who's so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. I've never seen that. I don't think that there is such a thing as a person who is so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. As a matter of fact, the only thing I've ever seen is a person who is so earthly minded that they do no heavenly good. All right. That's, that's what I've seen from the world anyway. When a person is heavenly minded, when they are seeking eternal benefit in Christ, when they're seeking to do the Lord's will, by necessity then, they automatically do earthly good to others. That's automatic. That's just automatic. That's what follows from loving God. It's actually the necessary consequence of following, following God, of seeking the Lord. It's the necessary consequence. When we seek the Lord, then we will love our neighbor. We will serve our neighbor. We will help them. We will do good to them. Because we love God. Because we're seeking Him. That's the reason why Jesus says what He says in Matthew chapter 6. That wonderful passage. Where He says, Do not worry about what you will eat, or about what you will drink, or your clothes, what you will wear. For the pagans run after these things. What does it mean the pagans run after these things? It means that they're striving for them. They're working for them. They want that. I want the next toy. I want more better food. I want better clothes. I'm focusing all my energy on pursuing earthly things. The pagans run after these things, Jesus says. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. You need clothes and you need food. Your heavenly Father knows it. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. For do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough worries of its own. That's the sentiment that Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, is what he's telling these people right here. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. He's saying, you're seeking after me for the wrong reasons. You, you're coming after me because 
You think I'm going to like give you another meal? No, no, no. The pagans run after those things. Seek the kingdom of heaven. Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. And you'll be taken care of. Our utmost earnestness must be employed in seeking salvation and not in seeking the vain glorious things of this world. Even the pagan orator Demosthenes said this, I am not so ill a merchant as to trade eternal things for temporal things. That's Demosthenes. Jesus here is saying that the focus and strength of our labor should be on eternity. So the crowd was looking to Jesus for temporal benefit instead of eternal, for physical food instead of spiritual food, for earthly good instead of heavenly good to themselves. And Jesus nevertheless tells them that he's willing. Listen, this is the amazing thing. Like, look at the passage again. He says, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give to you. So, I just have to say, this is the graciousness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who, though he knows the motives of those who are coming to him, are so bad, so wrong-headed, so ill-conceived, they should have seen the signs. They did see the sign. They should have pursued him because they saw the sign. He exposes to them, you're seeking the wrong thing. And then he says to them, nevertheless, I will give you living bread. I will give it to you anyway. Wow. It's so, it's so amazing. It's so beautiful. He diagnoses their problem and then he offers them the solution. He tells them that he's willing to give them the food that endures to eternal life. What a spectacular promise that is. He not only then gives the promise, I will give you food that will give you eternal life, that endures to eternal life. Not only does he say that, he even adds that God the Father has set his seal upon Christ. Which is another way of saying that Christ is able to give what he promises. The reason Christ is able to give what he promises is because of who he is. And it's because God the Father has set his seal upon him. So that whatever he promises must come to pass. It must happen. Charles Spurgeon has this book. You should get it. You should get this book. If you don't have this book, go and buy it. Write it down right now. It's called The Checkbook of the Bank of Faith. Look up that book. I was just at the Spurgeon Library this week. I went to Kansas City to Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and I had to go to the Spurgeon Library. I had one of his cigars that was sitting there in a glass case. I pulled the case off, and... Put it in my, no, I didn't do that. <laughs> but, but I did go and see the cigar and I saw all of his books and it was really cool. Spurgeon wrote a book called The Checkbook of the Bank of Faith and it's, it's actually shaped like a checkbook. And each day you can open it up. It's a devotional. Each day contains a promise from God, a promise. And then he gives a, a little devotional on the promise. And he calls it the checkbook of the bank of faith because each one of those promises we can take to the bank. We can take it to the bank. God's promises never bounce. He always fulfills them. Always. When Jesus says, I'm able to give you this living bread, this living water, God has set his seal upon me. It's the proof that he is able to fulfill what he promises us. Hallelujah. We can stand on that. In the moment of our death, we can stand on the promises of Christ and have no fear.
because he will always do what he says, what he promises. He is able to give eternal life to those who eat of his bread. So the crowd says to him, what must we do to do the works of God? Jesus says, do the work, work for that which is eternal. So they say, okay, then what is it? What must we do to do the works of God? This is a great question. In essence, they were asking, what must we do to be saved? And here is Christ's answer to them. Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Wow, that's so good. I could probably just spend a whole nother sermon talking about verse 29. This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. This is the work of God. This lies at the threshold of all acceptable obedience. One commentator says, being not only the prerequisite to it, but the proper spring of it. In that sense, it is the work of works, emphatically put here, the work of God. What, what does that mean? Everything else springs out of this, to believe in the one whom he has sent. From that comes every other acceptable work that we might do for God. The only way to ever do anything which is pleasing to God is to do it by faith in Christ. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. This is the reason why we can say all of the so-called good works of the world, any kind of good work that the world does, is what Jonathan Edwards called bad good works. Bad good works. Relative good works. It's not that there is no such thing as doing something better than how I could have done it. I, there is that, of course. It's better to help a lady across the street than push her into traffic. <laughs> All right? It's better to do that. Yet, if it is not done in faith, it is a bad good work. Because the only acceptable works are those done in faith. Faith is the, the main and principal work, says John Gill. And which is well pleasing in his sight, without which it is impossible to please him, and without which no work whatever is a good work. In other words, nothing is a good work unless it is done by faith in Christ. And this is the operation of God, which he himself works in men. It is not of themselves. It is the pure gift of God that you believe in him whom he hath sent. There are other works which are well-pleasing to God when rightly performed. But faith is the, quote-unquote, chief work. And others are only acceptable when done in the faith of Christ. This is the principle, purely God's work. It is an act or as it is exercised under the influence of divine grace, it is man's act that you believe. It's the object of Christ, as sent by the Father, as the mediator between God and men, as appointed by him to be the Savior and Redeemer, and believing in Christ is believing in, in the God that sent him. The, do, the Jews reduce all 613 precepts of the law, for so many... Say there are to this one, the just shall live by faith, Habakkuk 2.4. So then, is faith a work that we do? This is a good question. Is faith a work? We would say yes, except for this one thing. It is not a work that comes from within us. It is the gift of God. This faith itself is the work of God within us. God is the author of faith. He is the giver of faith. Faith is not something which naturally comes from within us, but rather a gift that God gives to us. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. What is not of yourselves? Faith is not of yourselves. It, what is the it? Faith is the gift of God. 
Faith is the gift of God. Our salvation, Paul says, is not a result of works so that no man may boast. That's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. But then he says in verse 10, for we are his workmanship. What does that mean? We are his workmanship. It means that God knitted me together in my mother's womb. I'm his creation. He imbued me with life. He breathed into my nostrils the breath of life. I'm the product of his workmanship, not only physically, but ultimately spiritually and in the new birth. That also is his workmanship. We are his workmanship, Paul says. It's a gift. This faith which leads to our salvation is a gift. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So we see that through the gift of faith comes the good works which God prepares for us to do. Therefore, Jesus tells the crowd that the work of God is to believe in him. It's to believe in him. They cannot do it. They cannot do this, what Jesus says. They cannot do this work of God in believing in him. Why? Because they're blind. They're blind to it. They don't see it. They don't see their necessity of him. They see their necessity of food that comes from him, but they don't see their necessity of him. Unless the Holy Spirit works in their heart and takes out the heart of stone, they cannot see it. They cannot believe. Believe, he says. And so what do the people say in reply? Look at verses 30 to 34. This is so insane. So they said to him, What then do you do for a sign? Okay, sorry. Sorry, I had to read it like that. What then do you do for a sign that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, that it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. And then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Has there ever been an example of such incredible dullness recorded in history as the dullness of this crowd? I say it in humility, knowing I would be just as dull in my natural state as they were. Absolutely. But this is dullness. I said at the beginning, we come to a passage today that almost defies comprehension. One in which we see the truly irrational and spiritually blind nature of unbelief. How can they say what then do you do for a sign so that we may believe, may we may see and believe in you? What work do you perform? When the very reason they traveled across the lake to find Jesus was because they not only witnessed Jesus doing a miraculous sign, they ate the miraculous sign with their mouths. <laughs> it's so crazy. It's really crazy that they would then say to him, Whoa, what are you going to do to show us that you can do signs? What? They partook of the miracle. And then they say, What sign do you do? That we may see and believe in you. Here we see a real-time outworking of 1 Corinthians 1, 21-23. For since the, in the wisdom of God, the world was through its wisdom, or the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs. 
and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Jews demand signs. That's what Paul, the Hebrew of Hebrews, says. But that seeking after its sign, a sign, was itself a wicked sign of unbelief. Seeking after signs is a sign of unbelief. What did Jesus say to the man in John 4, 48, who came looking for a miracle? Unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. Or what about Matthew 16, 4? A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, and no sign will be given to it except for the sign of Jonah. Yet here in this text, we see something even more terrible than that. It's more terrible than simply seeking a sign. These people were seeking a sign after they had already seen and participated in one. This is the depth of the darkness of the human mind and the human heart. This is the depth of it. It's so dark. It's so blind. Here we see the, the true nature, the spiritual nature of unbelief. They saw it. They participated. They ate it. And then they suppressed the truth and went to see if they could get their needs met once again from Jesus. Their, their physical, their physical hunger. Hunger. Instead of actually believing in him, when he says, I will give you this life eternal, they say, what sign will you show us? Prove it to us. I have to think that what they're trying to do there is manipulate Jesus. They're manipulating him. It's kind of a similar request to what Herod said to, to Jesus when Jesus was on trial. Show me a magic trick. Show me, Jesus. What thing will you do? Show me a miraculous sign. Do it. Like that. Herod wanted to use Jesus. What did Jesus do? He stayed silent. He did not give him what he wanted. Oh, Jesus, so oh, you see, uh, these things are signs, huh? Well, uh, I'm pretty hungry. And Moses gave us bread from heaven. So if you want to prove yourself that what you said is true, why don't you do what you did yesterday? Do it again. That's what they're saying. That's what they're saying to him. This is the depth of the darkness of the human mind and heart. It is what Abraham said to the rich man in hell. And he told him that if his brothers did not believe Moses, they would not believe even if someone was raised from the dead. Even if, even if Jesus in that very moment gave in to the request from the crowd and multiplied more bread and fish for them to eat, the very next day they would say the same thing to him. Oh, what are you going to do today now, Lord? Let me see what other sign you're going to do now. To try to use Jesus as a cosmic genie, as a slot machine, get what they can out of him, whatever uh, uh, temporal, uh, uh, fleshly desire, carnal desire. So as to illustrate their closed ears and hearts, like, listen now, again, closed ears and closed hearts, what did Jesus say to them? He said to them, do not seek after the food which perishes, but after that which endures to eternal life. He literally says it, right? He says it. And then what do they say? Well, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. In other words, <laughs> like Jesus our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and, and Moses gave that to us. So, you know, if you're the prophet like Moses, you should do it too. Jesus says, do not seek after food which perishes. What does the Bible say in Exodus 16 about the manna from heaven? 
And when a layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance, as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each man's need, one omer for each, according to the number of persons. Let every man take for those who are in his tent. Let the children of Israel, uh, then the children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less. So when they measured it by omers, he who had gathered much had nothing left over and he who had gathered little had no lack. Every man had gathered each one according to his need. And Moses said, let no one leave any of it until morning. Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses. But some of them left a part of it until morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was angry with them. So they gathered it every morning, every man according to his need. And when the sun became hot, it melted. So then, the very thing that the crowd says to Jesus after he says, do not seek after that food which perishes, they say, give us some manna. <laughs> no, don't you understand? The manna is the food that perishes. It's perishable food. It points to something greater, to the true bread that comes down from heaven, to Christ himself. And they refused to come to him. Manna developed worms and rotted or melted away. It was never meant to give eternal life to those who partook it. Rather, it pointed to a greater provision. A provision from heaven that could bestow eternal life. The Lord Jesus himself. And in the final section I'd like to take a look at today, we see Jesus remarkable patience and grace with the spiritually blind and deaf people in this audience. Now, uh, before I get there, I just want to say, <clears throat> I was just talking about this with my wife just the other day. How, you know, it can be hard having small children. And that, like, there are times when we will say something to our children. We'll say something to them. And they'll be like this. Yes, okay. And then you can ask them, did you hear what I just said? No. Repeat it back to me. I don't know. It's like that, kind of. It, I mean, it really is. It's like Jesus is talking and their ears are turned off. That's what's going on with these people. Their ears are turned off. They're not listening to him. I just know, I know as a parent, and as a fallen, sinful human being, I know how frustrating that can be when I'm saying something very important and my children aren't listening to me. Right? I know how frustrating that can be. There's a temptation to get angry about it. Listen! Open your ears! Listen to what I'm saying! I'm trying to tell you what's good for you. Listen to it. But Jesus doesn't do that. His, his patience is... It's, it's Jesus. He's perfect. He exhibits the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control in its fullest measure for each of them, of all of those things. He has patience in its most ripe sense, its perfect sense. And we see his patience with them. Like once they say, Moses gave us food from heaven. He could have been like, you don't listen. Get away from me. But he doesn't. He says this. Truly, truly, I say to you. It is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Oh, that they would just listen. What did the people say? Then they said to him, 
Lord, always give us this bread. And friends, Jesus is the true bread from heaven. He alone is able to give life to the world. His works are signs which point to his identity. And through those, um, they were given to show us who he is. And though those people did not still grasp this reality... Even without grasping the reality of Jesus' words, they still called out to him, Lord, give us this bread. Give us this bread. They did not even know what they were asking. They didn't know. They're like a blind baby. Crying out, Lord, give us this bread. Give it to us always. They did not know what they were asking, but they heard Jesus' offer of life truly in the same way that the Samaritan woman, when Jesus said to her, if you would ask me, I would give you living water. What did she say to him? Sir, give me this water. She called out to him, give me this water. These poor blind people called out to him, give us this bread always. Perhaps, perhaps that's all a person can muster. It's just that. Lord, I hear what you're saying. I don't even understand it. My understanding of your words is so so small, I feel like I'm walking around in the dark. But I heard you say, I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. I heard his voice saying it. I heard his voice saying, I can give you bread where when you eat of it, you will live forever. I need to say, Lord, give me this bread all. I need this from you, Lord. I need it from you. Cry out to him. Do you know many of these same disciples we're going to learn further on in this chapter? These same ones, many of them, ended up walking away from him and no longer followed him. Many did, but not all. Not all. For when Jesus turns to Peter and he says, are you going to leave me too? Peter says to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Amen. Let's ask the Lord now to give us this bread. Let's thank him. If we have already partaken of it, You may say, Lord, give us this living bread of you. Give it to us always. Though they did not know what they were asking for, as believers who are redeemed in Christ, we do know what we are asking for. When we say, Lord, give us this bread, what we're saying is, Lord, give us yourself. Give us yourself always. Let's ask him to do so now. Oh, Lord Jesus, give us this bread always, the living bread and the living water. Oh, Lord, give it to us. Give us of yourself. We're so grateful to you that you have had so much patience with us. (laughs) I know I look at these people in, in the darkness of their understanding and I see myself in it and how how much I could say that there was a time in my own life when I knew nothing of you and all of your words seemed like a jumbled mess together and I couldn't understand them. I couldn't I couldn't put my finger on it until you illuminated my heart and my eyes, until your your word came into me, until I ate of the living bread of Christ. And everything changed. And you gave eternal life to me. 
And I know that you've done that for people in this room, and I'm so grateful for that. If there's anyone even now within the sound of my voice, even on Facebook Live, that is listening to this message from John 6, and that has not called upon the name of Jesus, do so now. Say to him, Oh Lord, give me the bread of you. Let me feast upon you, Lord. Give me eternal life in Christ. Give me faith in Christ. Though you may not have ever loved him before, now is the day of salvation. Now is the day to turn to him, to repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the work of God, to believe in him whom he has sent. Oh, believe in him. When you believe in him, he'll give you this bread, this living bread and living water. Lord, we thank you for your promises that we can take to the bank. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we, can we, can I change the, the song? I'd like to do 664. Is that all right? Jesus is all the world to me. Let's stand and sing together. is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without Him I would fall. When I am sad to Him I go. No other one can cheer when I am sad, He makes me glad. He's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me, my friend in trial sore. I go to Him for blessings and sends the sun shine and the rain he sends the harvest golden grain sunshine and rain harvests of grain he's my friend Jesus is all the world to me and true Watches o'er me day and night, following him by day and night. He's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me. I want no better friend. I trust him now. I'll trust him when life's fleeting day shall end. Beautiful life with such a friend. Beautiful life that has no end. Eternal life, eternal joy. He's my friend. Amen. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless 
before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Father who alone is wise be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. May God be with you all.